let's go ahead and get started. So welcome to this month's Southern Utah Seniors Lecture Series. Um, before we get started, I would just let you know that um, next month we have our speaker for our lecture series is Britta Clark and she's with the Better Business Bureau. So she'll be talking to us about protecting yourself online. So if you want to register for that, you can do that on either the Seniors Conference website or our Area Agency on Aging website, if you're not already registered for that. And then we are going to hand this introduction over to Tracy Heavy Runner. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Tracy Heavy Runner, and I'm a program director for Home and Community Based Services from Five County Association of Governments Area Good. Agency on Aging. And today we have probably my favorite speaker, um, Teresa Burrell, and I call her Aunt T. A um, little bit about her she was born in Minnesota, but her family moved to Southern California when she was a child while attending high school and college. She began her career as a teacher working with students in diverse backgrounds and needs. After 12 years of teaching, Teresa decided to pursue her career as an attorney. Upon graduating from the University of San Diego, she maintained a private practice for 12 years. Now she's semi-retired. I don't think she's really retired at all. <laughs> Teresa switched gears again and started writing. And they are the most amazing series. I've read six of them so far. I love them. Um, and so she's written 15 novels and three children's books, and the children's books are funny and awesome. Um, so I hope you enjoy visiting with Teresa today. So I'm going to turn it over to Teresa. Thank you, Tracy. Everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, well, I got a, I'm, I'm going to try sharing the screen. So we'll see if this works. If not, well, I'll do it. With you. All right. Let's not do that. <laughs> okay, um, Trace is right. I was born in Minnesota um, in a little town called Fertile, which makes me a fertile girl. Uh, that's not a very good mantra when you're trying to get dates. But uh, I was the last of nine children. My mother took it literally. And I was, uh, well, started my life. I wasn't actually raised in Minnesota because I spent the first five years of my life in Minnesota. And then um, my dad he couldn't find work. And with nine kids, he needed, needed to feed them. And so he worked for the, well, he, he worked for the county as a, like an independent contractor. He had a tractor and he would mow the highways in the spring and the summer. But in the winter, he didn't have work because he didn't have a snowplow. Most of the people who did that had both and then they could work year round, but he didn't. So he um, was trying to find work. And my brother, Don, my oldest brother was in the military and he um, was stationed in San Diego, well, Camp Pendleton in Oceanside. And so he told my dad to come to California because there was lots of work. So dad threw us in the back of an old panel pickup and we drove to California. And um, that was an experience in, in itself because there were seven kids along. And then somebody named Cousin Victor, who I have no clue who that was. He wasn't a cousin. I don't think, I think we just called him Cousin Victor. Um, so there were three adults, my mom and dad and Cousin Victor in the front and uh, seven kids in the back. My two oldest brothers were both in the military at that time. So um we drove out here and uh we dad tried to find work and he was having trouble but he found work in the potato fields and so we all went to work and we would um pick potatoes we pick oranges we picked olives we did lots of different kinds of picking um but the potatoes we were my sister lana and i she's the one next to me she's a year and a half older than i am we were the smallest and we would get one on each side of the potato sack and we'd drag it along and throw the potatoes in. And when it got too heavy, one of the bigger kids would come take our bag and give us an empty one and off we go. And then all the money went to the family. So, um, and we didn't have a house to stay in. So we met these people, we kept trying to find a place to stay 
and my parents met some people, I think at church, and they said, well, we have a chicken coop that you can clean out and you can use until you can find a house. So we did that. We stayed a while in the chicken coop. It was warm and we weren't, you know, it wasn't cold or anything. It was, it was airy <laughs> because there was no windows or anything on it. Um, but we lived in the chicken coop for, I don't know, two weeks, maybe a month. I don't remember how long. And then we finally found a house and we moved in. And we went back and forth from California to Minnesota every spring. Uh, we'd go to, in the spring, we'd go back to, and then right around uh, Halloween, we'd come back to California. So we'd be out here for the winter. And we did that for five years. And then my mom, my mother passed away. And I was 10 then. And so my dad decided not to go back to Minnesota after that. And he got a, a job in Lake Elsinore. And we stayed there. And um, a year later, my father did the best thing he's ever done for us. And he married a wonderful woman. And we had a stepmother who we, we all called mom. And we had her for um, another 20 or 30 years. So uh, we were very fortunate to have her. Um, and then I decided to go to school, to college, and she encouraged me to go to college. Um, my dad thought we should be barefoot and pregnant, but uh, that was uh, just the way it, he was pretty old fashioned. So, but my new mother encouraged us to go to, to school and I went to college and got my teaching degree. And I taught school for 12 years. And then I decided I wanted more and I need, had to go back to school. And I decided I wanted to be an attorney, which I kind of always wanted to be, but I never thought I could and, and never thought I'd have the money or anything to, to go to law school or um, uh, the smarts for that matter. So, but I did and I got my law degree and I practiced law for 12 years. And then I was ready for another change. And I started a business of my own. And I saw these tiki huts in a magazine and they're, they were called Kubo's. They were like a gazebo with a palapa top. And so I um, saw they were manufactured in the Philippines. So I jumped on a plane, flew to the Philippines, set up manufacturing, started shipping in tiki huts. And, Kubos and bars, bamboo bars. And um, I also did some other stuff, some other small businesses on the side. And I did that for 12 years. <laughs> so my careers have all lasted 12 years. My personal relationships about six. So I decided I'm twice as good at my professional life as I am my personal life. Uh, but I, um, after that, I decided to, um, I was still practicing law, actually, when I wrote my first book. And some of these careers had kind of, over, well, the, the business career and the law career um, overlapped some. And I had this case that was really horrendous. And I decided I, um, I would write about it. And I'd always wanted to write a book, not uh, just to see if I could. You know, we all think we have at least one book in us, right? Um, so I was working 12 to 14 hours a day practicing law. I was working as a juvenile court, <coughs> excuse me, um, dependency attorney, excuse me. And I would, I was, um, uh, mostly representing abused children. And I spent my days in court and then my evenings working on, on cases and getting ready for trials and my weekends and sometimes evenings visiting kids in foster homes and group homes and um, sometimes traveling to see them. But uh, so I decided, okay, how am I going to do this? I'm going to write a book. There's no hours left. So I set my alarm an hour and a half or early every morning and got up and started writing. And I wrote for six months. And when I was done, I had this, the advocate. <coughs> Sorry. Um, 
it was not very well written, but it was a good story. And um, I didn't know anything about writing, so I, I really didn't know what I was doing right or wrong. So I went to a writer's conference just to learn some stuff. And I submitted 20 pages and a, and a uh, publisher asked for my manuscript. She said, go home, edit it. She said, how many pages is it? And I said, no, I think it's about 100,000. And she said, cut 10,000 and then send it to me. Well, I got home, it was 120,000. So I had a lot of cutting to do. But I also learned a lot about writing at the conference. And I, and I realized there was stuff that didn't need to be in there. So the book got edited like 12 times before it was published, but the storyline never changed. So the storyline is pretty much what it was. And it's like inspired by that case I was involved in. It is fiction. There's a lot of things that are different, but all the courtroom stuff um, are things you'd see that, that we actually did. Uh, the way we picked our cases, um, that kind of stuff. And, and all the courtroom scenes are, are um, you know, legally correct. So, um, and I really, I really um, enjoyed writing it. And I thought, okay, this isn't, a, you know, maybe I'll try it again. I didn't even intend to get it published when I actually wrote it. I wrote it to see if I could do it. And that publisher picked me up and um, I wrote that book. And then I wrote a second book and I was out marketing myself in bookstores and, and that sort of thing. And I, and another publisher, publisher approached me and asked for my next two books. So um, I, I signed with, with that publisher and then I just kept writing. And the book was, um, this book's called The Advocate. The second book is The Advocate's Betrayal. And the betrayal, um, is when I, when I wrote that one, we picked the name and then the third book, the publisher said, okay, you need a C word because you've already started the alphabet. I've got the advocate and the advocate's betrayal. So the third one was called the advocate's conviction. Now that seemed like a good idea at the time, but now that I've written 12 of them, I realize I still have 14 to go if I want to finish the alphabet. Um, but the books are, are um, all those books are all legal suspense murder mysteries. And when I got to book six, I had a character named Tooper um, who's loosely based on my brother. He's an older guy who likes guns, gambling, and women. He lives in Montana. And um, my, the readers liked him so well, I started his own series. And so I have three books in that series now. This is the most recent one. And that is, that is Tooper on, a, on his horse. That's my brother. I named him Tooper because I, that's what I called my brother Phil when I was a kid. So, um, and he's getting a lot, he's having so much fun with the fact that I put his picture on the book. He's been passing my, my bookmarks out all over the state of Montana. I think I'm going to have my biggest book sales in Montana for the next couple months. But uh, <clears throat> that book is not legal suspense, but it is mystery. They are whodunits. And the books are all available on Amazon and, and some bookstores, depending on, they don't all carry them, but, and Kindle and Audible. So if you read, use any of those, you're certainly welcome to get them there. Um, so um, when I wrote, um, I also started writing some other stuff. I did a marketing book for authors and I did a uh, three children's books and I have one of those. This is the first one. Gaspar is a lactose intolerant ghost who loves ice cream. And <laughs> He's, uh, he, the, there's three books in this series. My nephew did the, all the illustrations and he did it. He did a great job. He actually, he's an artist in his own right. So he did, uh, it's kind of been a family thing. My sister, um, I call her Gigi, Madeline does all my book covers and my niece does my, helps me with marketing and is kind of an assistant for me. So 
it's been fun doing this. This has been a whole different kind of career than I've had in the past. Um, but it's been fun because I've been able to involve my family and I've been able to travel with it. And um, I should be should be retired, but like Tracy said, I I probably I probably never will retire um, because I enjoy I enjoy the work and I I enjoy the writing. So um, if any of you I don't know do, do any of you write? Have you ever any of you ever tried writing? There's a little um, what's that little sign you can do on here? The little reactions you can do a thumbs up. I don't see any thumbs. Oh, there's a thumb. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's another one. Well, it's it's a fun thing to do. Um, and it's not everybody does uh, gets not everybody gets published as quickly as I did. I mean, it can be very a uh, really difficult thing to do, but you can self-publish now and there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I do, I, some of my books are self-published. And I've also, um, oh, I've also co-authored a book just recently with another writer and that book's not out yet, but um, you, and we're going to self-publish that one because it's easier, first of all, to, to do it. And, um, and, and it's a perfectly acceptable now way to, to um, to get your material out there. And also it's really the only way to make any money on it is, it, is to get itself is to be self-published because so much of the money goes to the publisher. When I first started writing my first book, my first publisher, I got 46 cents a book and I would stand in Barnes and Noble from Friday morning to Sunday night, sell about a hundred books which was a lot of books, but it was $46 <laughs> when I was done. Uh, most of the time, it didn't pay for my gas to get to the bookstore and back. Um, and I, I kind of, I did, got out there and did my own marketing anyway. With publishers, so often now they don't market for you. They do a little bit in the beginning and that's it. And I wanted to get into the bookstores, so... I went to, I started approaching bookstores and I, I couldn't get in. They kept telling me, well, you know, most new authors, they get, they sell maybe five or 10 books and then that's it, if you're lucky. And so I kept going back and back and asking the, the community relations managers at Barnes and Noble. Um, and finally, one said, I said, look, if you, buy you order 100 books i'll come in i'll come in and i'll sell the books and if i don't sell them i handed her my credit card i said here if i don't sell them you can buy them back at re i'll buy them back at retail you won't have lost a penny you'll have sold every hundred book you've ordered and um we're both you know i learned my lesson and you still got your money so she said well you seem pretty sure of yourself the truth is I had never sold a book <laughs> before. I mean, I was brand new. I didn't know if I could do it, um, but I thought, what the heck, what have I got to lose, right? So um, she said, okay, I'll order 20 books and you can come in and um, for a couple of, I come in on a Saturday and, if, and let's see how it works. So I came in at, at the time allotted and I sold the 20 books within an hour. And she, I said, now, will you order 100 books and have me back for a weekend? And so she, she did. And she also wrote me um, a recommendation for other community relations managers that I was able to send out. So I was able to get into lots of other stores. So, um, but it's just, you know, you, you, you do what you have to do to, to get the job done. I have... Um, Oh, I have a cute little story, but when I was book signing once, I had this woman come into the store and it was in Palm Desert, I think, at the Barnes and Noble. And she looks, picks up my book and she goes, oh, wow, I love these kinds of books. I love legal suspense. This is my favorite kind of book. This is, oh gosh, 
I really like this kind of thing. And then she set the book down after a while and she walked away. And she come back and she was carrying another book, some by a different author. And actually it was by Lisa Scottolini. I don't know if any of you have read her, but um, she's a well-known legal suspense author. And she comes up to me, she hands me the book and she says, will you sign this? And I said, no, I can't, I'm not Lisa. And she says, but she's not here. I thought, okay, well, I guess if you've seen one author, you've seen them all. But obviously I didn't sign up for her, but I did, I did send Lisa an email. I'd met her at a conference not long before then. And I sent her an email and told her the story. So uh, she thought it was pretty funny. She said, I'll just sign it next time. <laughs> no, I won't do that. But, um, but yeah, people are funny. You just never know. Uh, let me see. Uh, do we have any questions? Let's go there and I'll see if I can uh, talk about what you might be interested in. Nope. We did have one question um, and it's, what would you tell people who are looking to make a change in their lives or write their third chapter? What words of encouragement would you give them? All right. Well, I, I kind of go with the, the Nike logo, logo, just do it. Um, it's, it's kind of the way I've done things all my life. I don't know I can't, so I just do them. Um, and occasionally I discover that things I've tried haven't worked too well, but most of the time um, it, it has worked. And as far as writing, it's a great career for somebody who's in their third chapter because you can do it from home you can do it from anywhere um, and you can't uh, you can't really do anything about publishing until you've written a book so you just write it write it and then you um, then you start to get it out there and I am readily available by email if anyone has any questions on where to go once they get that far but the first step is to write a book and then you're gonna to have to have it edited and you can't, um, can't have it edited by your spouse or your friend or that you have to have it professionally edited. That's the biggest mistake that a lot of new writers make whether they're submitting it to a publisher or doing it themselves. Because if you put bad material out there, no one will ever look into your second book. So, but you just do it. Um, and I, I, when I write, I mean, if you're going, if you get serious about it, you want to write, you need to dedicate some time to it. Um, I kind of go by the Raymond Chandler um, method. He, uh, Raymond Chandler always said, I only write when I'm motivated and I'm motivated every morning at nine o'clock. So he would just, he had an allotted time and he would start to write. That's basically what I do, except I usually start about six, not nine. And I write till 11 and then I stop. And I try to get 2000 words done a day. And I don't write every day, but I write every day that I'm home because that's where it's easiest for me to write. Um, I travel a lot and I do a lot of book events. So I don't write on those days, but when I'm home, I write till 11 and then I stop. And, um, and then I'll do marketing and that kind of stuff in the afternoon or after I've taken my walk or get some exercise. So, but yeah, the best thing is to just do it. We did have another question is what, have there been any drawbacks? To my writing career? Yeah, um, yeah certainly. <laughs> um, you know, you get stuck sometimes. Um, I don't really, I, I know they call it writer's block, I guess, but I don't think it's really writer's block. It's just that you haven't figured out where you're going next. Um, my friend who I just co-authored a book with, she is a plotter and I'm what is called a pantser. She plots everything, everything is written down. She gets it in an outline and has it all outlined. Um, I don't do that. 
I write by the seat of my pants. That's what they call them, pantsers. Um, but I start, I get an idea and I get an opening line and then I start to write. My book, number four, the first line in it is The Advocate's Dilemma. The first line is, why is there a dead man on your desk? And I didn't know who killed the guy until over halfway through the book. But I had an idea to go with and I, and I just started writing and then it went to the next thing and the next thing. And I think, okay, what's the worst thing that when it starts to get a lull, I'll say, what's the worst thing that can happen to my characters right now? And then I put them in a mess and then I have to get them out. Um, and, and you're dropping clues along the way. Um, but the other thing I discovered is if I don't know who the killer is in the beginning, neither do my readers. And it makes sense because how would they? I haven't given them any clues. Um, but some of the books, it, um, the readers figure it out easier. And those are always the ones I knew early on. So I must give something away in my writing when I'm doing it. And occasionally I've had to go back in and put some clues in. So it's not totally out there. And it's not like, I never just pull somebody out of the blue that had nothing to do with the story and make them the killer. It, it actually unfolds and makes sense. But yeah. Uh, we, had an, we had another question. Um, this one, her son just published a book, and but she doesn't think he's marketing it. Would you be willing to give some tips? Maybe like by email, we could get you guys connected or something. Absolutely. Um, who is that coming from? Um, this is coming from Champlain Pamela. Okay, Champlain. I would be glad to just... Um, Send me, uh, send me an email and I don't know, um, oh, I had that all on my PowerPoint, but I don't have it here. So my email address is Teresa at Teresa So if you've oh, got my name, you've got my email address. Could you please print that in the chat? And my son's okay. book is. I really don't think he's. The Compass Maker. What kind of a book is it? What genre? It is historical fiction. Oh, great. I like this kind. Um, so, yeah, if we could just get your email, if possible, in the chat, that would be great. Did that work? Yes, Teresa at TeresaBurrell.com. Perfect. Thank That's you. Right. Yeah. Um, and any, by the way, um, how many of you use Kindle? And give me that thumbs up a thing again. That would be great. Okay, Tracy, Carrie. Is that it? Hmm. Okay. Another Tracy. Okay, oh, any of you that use Kindle or if you use Audible, if you send me an email, I can send you the first uh, um code and audible to the first book in the series. And I can send you a Kindle copy of the first book in the series. If I was in person, I'd give you actual books. But, um, but if you can, if you send me an email, just tell me you were on the, on the Zoom meeting and I will send you um, a Kindle copy or audible copy, depending on what you want. Okay, All right, yes. And had a couple more questions. Okay. Um, we work with a lot of senior centers. So this question is, how could a senior center set up book clubs or even maybe a writing club? Oh, well, oh, you just have to, well, it's easy to do because you just have to, um, I, I guess, well, of course, you'd have to check with your senior center to make sure that you can work out the timing. But, and then just um, start it. I mean, just put the, the word out there. Um, a writing club, it's probably gonna be smaller because you're gonna have a less people that are interested in that. But uh, I know a lot of senior centers who have both writing clubs and, um, and book clubs. 
And a lot of them are doing the book clubs still on Zoom now, and they couldn't do them this last year. But if you did, so you could do it that way. Um, by the way, I'll be glad to speak at any writer's club or book club if anybody sets one of those up. Um, the writing club, uh, writer, when I speak to writers group, I have a whole thing where I, uh, I go through how to, how to get started, how to um, write, and mostly how to market, because that's usually the biggest concern. But if they're new writers and they want tips on writing, then I can do that as well. I don't know if I answered the question really, but I think you, it's pretty simple. You just put out the word and let people know and then start it. Um, if you belong to a, a book club, another book club, then you know how they work. Uh, the writers clubs, you pretty much have to have somebody um, leading it who can teach something. Um, but then you... Most of the ones I've seen, they they set up, they they do actual writing at the clubs, or they write at home and bring it in, and they do readings, and then they share that with each other. And one of the rules is always that you don't criticize writing and writing clubs, um, because people aren't they're there to get feedback, and the feedback isn't criticism necessarily. People need encouragement, and you can you can explain um, writing rules and that kind of stuff. But one of the rules in writing clubs is always that you don't say whether you like it or not. That's not the issue. Um, uh, that's not the concern. That's not what you're there for because not everybody likes everybody's writing. So I don't know if that helped, but. We have, we have a group at our Canab Senior Center who's joining us today, and they had a question about um, research sources and, and maybe like how long does it take you usually to write a book? Okay, it's a good question. Uh, my first book when I was still practicing law, when I wrote it, uh, it took me about six months. And, but I was, I was limited in my time, but, um, like I said, I wrote an hour and a half every day. And by the end of the six months, I had material. <laughs> it wasn't necessarily good. Uh, but I have, my longest book has taken 11 months. My shortest was during COVID where I did nothing but stay home and write. And I had that one done in seven weeks. So, uh, but normally it's four or five months for me to write a book. And I travel in and out a lot. So, um, but you write about most books should be around 70, 80,000 words. If you're writing mystery, if you're writing fantasy or, um, or if you're writing um, science fiction, they're longer because you usually have to, and they're expected to be longer, more like 120,000 words because you have to create a whole world in it. So, our world already exists if you're writing in, um, you know, regular time. But if you're writing, you know, fantasy or science fiction, they need to be longer. Uh, what was there was another part to that question? Uh, the other part was where do you get your uh, research sources? Oh, okay. Well, I write legal suspense and I practice law for twelve years, so I have a lot of, I have a lot of material, and my books are all. Um, based on actual cases, but they are fictionalized, but there's most, there's always something in there. Now the fiction that I wrote, the spinoff series I wrote is not legal suspense. And so it's, it's kind of different, but um, there's a lot of times there's police stuff that I need where I'm not too familiar with. And I, I have friends who are, and relatives who are police officers and I usually call on them. Um, I have a friend who's a private investigator who I've used, got a lot of information from in, in that realm. And now that I've been out of practicing law for a while, I've talked to my friends who are lawyers who are still practicing who, so I can keep up with the correct information. Uh, but I also have done things like I've called up, uh, you know, the medical 
examiner's office and talk to somebody. Most people are really good. You just tell them what you're actually doing because otherwise you sound like a nut. You know, I want to know, you know, what, how you cut that body open doesn't sound too, um, too good unless you explain where you're going with it. But the other thing I do with as far as um, research is I, when I write about a place, I've been there. And if I haven't been there, I go there. So um, it's an excuse to travel for one thing. But my second book, yeah, the second one, I, my character travels to Chicago and then outside of Chicago into Michigan a little ways. And I got on Google and I did a series, uh, I did an aerial view and I looked at the place. It was a little tiny town. I needed a small town out there for, for this to work. And I found this town called Elsie. And um, Elsie has one stoplight. I think it's a stoplight. I mean, just be a stop sign. No, I think it's a stoplight. But there's only one. It's a very small town. And I could see everything. And so I wrote up all about this. And, but I didn't feel real comfortable. So I had a nephew living in Michigan. And so I, I flew to see him. And we drove to Elsie. And it was a good thing I did because... The thing I could not tell from the aerial view, I could see something, but I couldn't tell what it was, was this huge, huge statue of a cow in the middle of town. Now, anybody who'd been to Elsie would know you hadn't been there if you didn't mention that cow. <laughs> um, I guess, you know, Elsie, right? So um, I wrote that into my book after I had, um, before I sent it off to the editor, but so I've done that kind of research. I know I have friends who get started doing research and most of the time online, they do a lot of online research and they, it's a real easy distraction. You can spend nine hours researching to you know one hour of writing. And I would encourage you not to do that. Um, start writing, write your story, keep writing, and then uh, go back and check on stuff and fill it in. Go back and fix it. And that's true of anything when you're doing. If, you, if you're if you stuck, just kind of keep writing. Um, take it to the next level if you can. And uh, Raymond Chandler used to say, if you're writing mysteries and you get stuck, just kill somebody. And it always, you know, makes for another story storyline. Um, but yeah, just you, at least don't stop and edit keep writing and then go back and do your editing and some of your research. Um. All right, we have a couple more questions. Um, going with our third chapter theme, what has been the best part of this third chapter? Well, um, I think the best part has been, I've been able to do it on my time. And you know, like I said earlier, you do, you have to, if you're gonna do it as a business, if you're going to try to sell your books and make money at them, you've got to treat it like a business, but I still can do it on my own time. And I can work from home um, and I, I write and I can schedule stuff. I can take vacations. I can do any of that now and do it on my own time. I had a hard time getting away when I was practicing law, uh, ever getting away from the courtroom because you had cases and you got scheduled on days you didn't want to be there and it didn't matter. You had to show up. So, um, but that's been one of the, the, the best parts about it. And I've always wanted a job I could work and, and travel. And so I've been able to combine that. Um, I, I travel as much as I can. I do as many speaking events as I can um, around this country. And I go to writers conferences, which is, fun. I get to meet all these famous authors who I've been reading for years and, um, and get to be on, on the same panels with them and stuff. And that's been a lot of fun. All right. How do you overcome your writer's block or um, that getting stuck? And what techniques do you use to get thoughts flowing again? Um, I think I got into some of that, but yeah, if I get stuck, I just, I try to keep writing or go to another scene that I know I'm going to have in the book. Um, 
most of the time I keep going in order, but occasionally I will go, okay, I know that this is going to happen and I can set that up. And so I can write that and then come back. I, I think writer's block is just not knowing where you should go next. That's really all it is. So, you know, you do like Raymond Chandler does and you can kill somebody or you just get your characters in a mess. Okay, what's, what's the worst thing that could happen to them now? That I, now they're doing this, what can I do with them? Um, and I just, and I see it in my head as a movie. I, I see them moving, I see them um, doing their stuff and what the next scene would be. I see all that in my head when I'm writing and then I just keep that going. And there are times where I'll write, you know, maybe only a thousand words a day. And there'll be times when I write 3000 words a day, but it's always, it's more often right around two because that's what I do at the pace I normally move. And yeah, you just have to uh, try to keep going. And if you, if you can't write like a pantser, then write like a plotter and make an outline figure out what your next scenes are likely to be and where you want it to go and get it all the way to the end. Um, and then go back and start writing. Uh, my friend LJ, when she writes, she's got everything plotted out and she just, once she's done that, that's what takes her time. The rest goes really easy because she knows what each next step is. And so she just keeps writing, but yeah, can't pants it, plot it. What would your advice be to people who are looking for a new hobby or activity for their third chapter, but maybe writing isn't their thing? Do you have some advice for those people? Uh, well, you know, I have I have so many things in my life I've always wanted to do. So um, I just I just do them. Um, and that's how I did my business. That's how I started writing. So I guess. Find what interests you. Think about the things you enjoy doing. So it's not a job. It's not a task. And then just do it. Just do it. It's Nike has the right deal, the right idea. Um, there's most things now are you can get any information you want on the Internet. And if you don't know how to do something they think you might want to do, YouTube it because it's out there. You can bet that it's there. And there's usually people that are willing to help. I know uh, in the writing world, people are very willing. And I've always been available to help anybody who has questions. And people were there for me. And I, I'm sure that's true probably of a lot of areas, a lot of professions, a lot of hobbies. I know my sisters who, my sister who loves to knit. I mean, she will talk to anybody about it. Or, um, and she also makes my earrings, by the way. This is my last book, um, but she will, you know, most people are willing to give advice and tell how they got started or what materials you need to do something. Um, just ask. Are there any other questions out there? We've gone through all the questions we have in our chat so far, but are there any other questions out there? If you'd rather ask your question yourself, you're welcome to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question as well. How many of you have read Earl Stanley Gardner or saw a Perry Mason movie or TV show? Okay. Okay. Almost everybody knows who he is. Um, he was a big inspiration to me. As a child, I saw, I started reading Perry Mason books, and I think I read everything Earl Stanley Gardner ever wrote. And I gave him credit for two of my careers, my law career and my writing career, because I was so interested in, um, in his books and his storylines and, and legal issues that it inspired me to to pursue a legal career. He also lived not far from us. He, his, he lived in Fallbrook for a while, um, in the Temecula area. 
And uh, one of his secretaries was the mother to one of my friends in school and Joel, Joey C. And Joey, um, I had a mad crush on Joey and I went to his house once and I was so excited to meet his mother because she worked for Earl Stanley Gardner. And um, I was, I think in the long run, I was more interested in my, his connection to, to Earl Stanley Gardner than I was to him. But um, I never got to meet him, uh, but I did read everything he wrote. And, and then when I, went to, when I went to law school and, and became a lawyer, um, I had one real Perry Mason moment in court. And it, it was exciting because it's one where you trip up a witness and they actually tell you something they didn't ever intend to tell you. That doesn't happen very often. But I remember I had one, it was a psychologist who, um, who was speaking and she had some written work that was totally different from what she was saying. And I, I got to have my Perry Mason moment in court. So, but yeah, I, I would encourage anybody that's, I mean, wants to start a third chapter. I've started, you know, several chapters. I've changed my careers a plenty of time during my life. And usually just because I wanted to try something new and do something different, or I felt like I reached um, kind of a peak and I couldn't do that job any better than I was doing it. So it was time to move on. Um, I think this will probably be my last career because I'm getting up there and it's probably going to last more than 12 years because I've already got 10 in. So, um, and I, if I'm going to write, if I'm going to finish the alphabet, I'm definitely, it's definitely going to take more than two more years. So this is probably my last one. So. Any other questions? Okay. Well, I oh, one more I, one more question. Oh, Are more okay. of your books on Kindle? Pardon? You have more of your books on Kindle. I have all my books on Kindle. Um, all there's twelve books in the first series that um, I've written through the L word, and I will start. I'm going to start the M the M word soon. Um, but they're all on Kindle. And then I have the spinoff from book six, An Advocate's Felony, the Tuber Mystery Series. I have three in that series right now. And they're all on Kindle. And so are my children's books and my marketing book for writers. And they're all on Audible as well. What I've liked about your books is when I have them on Audible and I'm listening to the car, I don't have to worry about who's in the car with me. And so that's been something really nice that it's a good book, you follow it, but you don't have the heart attack moment that there's something in there that you weren't looking for. Yeah. Okay. So I love that about your books. Well, my books are there. There's no graphic sex or graphic violence in them, but I tell people they're good anyway. Um, they do have a lot of, um, uh, tense moments, but, um, and the language is, I keep the language as clean as I can. There's occasionally, um, got a felon who's saying something, or, or my first book, I think I had, I had a methamphetamine freak in court who had just lost her kids. She's not going to say, oh, gee whiz, you know, but, um, the, the language is very, the bad language is very minimal and only used when it would when they when when the scene wouldn't work without it, so. Ready. I'll throw in one more question okay. for those of us who are a little bit more timid and reserved, and and have some hard time just doing it. What would be your advice for us to be able to push through that discomfort, to go out and try something new? Well, I tell you, when I started, <laughs> when I was a kid, I wouldn't say a word. I was the quietest child in the family. 
Of course, I was the last of nine. You don't get nobody ever talks over you anyway. But um, I didn't say a word in school until my until seventh grade. I was so timid, and my had a seventh grade teacher who who brought me out and really got me kind of at least talking and stuff. Um, I kind of I decided at that point that I was going to do if something made me uncomfortable, I was going to do it until it didn't. And so um, I've made myself do things. When I my first when I started teaching, I thought, how am I going to teach? How am I going to talk to these kids? I don't even talk to people. And uh, but I just got up there and did it and. It was a little easier, I think, because they were children than it would have been if I was working with adults. But I got very comfortable with that. But then when I started practicing law, and, that, and I chose a career uh, where I not only the part of the career, I did litigation. I was in the courtroom. I had to talk. And the first time I was in courtroom in juvenile court, this judge was hard of hearing and my voice was, I mean, I hardly projected my voice and he yelled at me. I was so embarrassed and so scared. And, but boy, I went home and I decided I'm not gonna, you know, I'm gonna speak up, they're gonna hear me. And so I went back and just um, made myself do it until I was comfortable. When I started selling books in the bookstores, I didn't, I didn't know what to say to people and I was afraid to talk to strangers. I mean, um, but I just made myself do it. And I, uh, the thing about, you know, if you really can't do that, then you do something where you don't have to work with people. But um, once you do anything a few times, it becomes so much easier. And I, I love speaking events. I, I love now speaking in front of big crowds. That's my favorite thing to do. In, you know, put a thousand people in the room and I'll get up there and talk to them. I'm nervous when I first start, but once I get rolling, I'm, I'm fine with it. So, but yeah, it's been, you just have to do it. I don't know any other way to, 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 uh, to make it happen, whatever your choice is. Anyone else? We've got about three more minutes if anybody has any more questions that they want answered. Now's your chance. Well, like I said, if there's anybody out there that wants a Kindle copy of the book, send me an email. Um, and I will send you send you a copy of the book and uh, a Kindle copy or an audible copy. Just trying to look at some of the names here. In some in your book, you use a lot of um isms oh jp isms <laughs> and they're the funniest thing can you tell them about that yeah um i have a character named jp and he's from texas and he ha uses a lot of slang and um my sister is married to um a guy named johnny pippen his initials are jp and he's from texas and he Whenever he says one of his lines, I write it down or Marjo will write it down and send it to me. Um, now his character is actually, the JP character is actually based on a friend of mine who was a private investigator, somebody I've known for since I was 19. Um, and, but the JP isms come from Johnny Pippen and they are things like, um, I think of one offhand, um, you don't, you know, you, Park in your car. Um, I know how does it go? Jeez, oh, I can't think of any right now. I just um, put you on the spot. 
Yeah. The um, one I can think of is probably not appropriate. Oh. So. <laughs> it's when it was so hot out. Um, talking oh. about being hotter than a tomcat with a little more verbiage in there. Oh, yeah. I lost it. I He's one of the funniest people I've ever met. And then it goes into this character and you're reading the book. And so for me, I don't know your friend. So I see Uncle Johnny. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the isms are the be- I, one of the best parts of the book. Yeah. Yeah, he says a lot of Southern slang uh, expressions and um, he says stuff like um, parking your car in the garage. No, parking in the garage doesn't make you uh, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than parking your car in the garage makes you a car. You know, that kind of stuff. Or, um, well, you know, I'll. If I, I'll, I'll punch you into Tuesday or uh, just, uh, just a lot of, gosh, he's got so many of them. And I know I've got thousands of them and I can't think of any, but they are fun. They're, they're a fun thing for the character. I guess we will just all have to read your books and look I, for them. I guess so. <laughs> Perfect. And on that note, we just want to thank you for being here today with us. I know... I feel like I picked up on a lot of different things that you were saying and it felt very motivational and inspiring. So I hope our audience today has gotten that from you as well. And judging by the comments, it looks like that's the case. We've got a lot of clapping um, going on with the reactions. And then there's a comment that says, thank you for your insights. So we just appreciate you being here and we'd like to thank everyone who attended as well and remind you again that this is a series and we'll have an event again next week. So again, thank you, Teresa. And thanks everyone for being here. Well, thank you for having me. I, I really appreciate it. And I look forward to hearing from any of you. If you have any questions, just send them to my email and I'll be glad to answer them. <laughs>